Two weeks ago, when Elon finally closed on Twitter, we, we wanted to investigate what's happening, why, and is it what it looks like? We have four hypotheses and research questions associated with those hypotheses to inform our research. So the first is the obvious, lots in migration, a little bit tongue in cheek given that it's Twitter. This does seem to be a movement of movement of migration, but we also wanted to understand who was moving. And our hypothesis is that the people moving to Mastodon away from Twitter seem to be on average more wealthy, more white, and politically more left-leaning than the average person in their region or country, or than the average person who uses social media writ large. One of the reasons that I'm here is that I've studied um, platform migrations in online communities. And one of the things that we found in our research is that in order for there to be a really significant migration, like a lot of people leaving one platform and those same people leaving another platform, there has to be both a compelling reason to leave and an immediate viable alternative option. So like the example of this we looked at in our research before was people from LiveJournal moving to Tumblr after some significant policy changes. So I think what we are seeing now is that Mastodon is the most immediate viable alternative option to Twitter for which there is now a very compelling reason for people to leave. So that that is one thing that Mastodon is right now. There are opportunity costs to leaving Twitter, and those opportunity costs are borne differently by different people. I saw John Green on TikTok being like, you know, I was I was on Twitter and then and then you know talking about how like bad it is right now. And then my partner was like, Well, why are you there? And he's like, Because I need to like pitch my charity thing. But then I noticed that like I get more hits from TikTok. And so he doesn't need Twitter as much because A people know who he is. He's got plenty of marketing push. It would be different for like an author of a marginalized identity. And he also has an audience already on TikTok. If you are say an author or some other kind of artist who has built up your, you know, your audience on Twitter and that's all you have, like telling that person to just leave Twitter and join this brand new platform where, where maybe if you work for a while, you're going to thousand followers. Like that's very different. So I think that both the pull factors and the push factors are different for different people. Do you think that the Fediverse is an equalizer or a sign of privilege? Any new technology, it is more on the privilege side than on being more democratic in nature. Maybe in future, when we have uh, resources to adapt it in a manner that anyone can join and they don't feel intimidated by it, maybe then it will become more democratic. But as of now, it is less democratic than what it appears to be on paper. As in technological innovation increases, it's really the innovators and the early adopters that are going to continue to migrate and end up at these new spaces. And I fear that it gets stretched out further and further. So I lean more into the privileged space. How long would it take for my my ears to end up on Mastodon. You know, like that that kind of question comes top of mind for me. I, I think my mom would never make it there, but you know, my aunt tries to be on top of trends in the internet. We've been here before. So we kind of like were saying, do you remember when the bulletin boards were when only one user could call in at a time and you had to save your shareware off to your floppy disk? The early adopters have a privilege, if you will. They may not be wealthy, they may not be well connected, but they're curious and they have some skills or they have some ability to be able to willingly play in this playground. And I think that's just where we are. We're just at the beginning. This is, I wonder if we took a show of hands with the young people here, do you even know what a fail whale graphic looks like? Because that is still very clear in my mind. Twitter broke all the friggin' time the first three years, you know, it was no big deal. And people are freaking out if they, they don't have their service for two minutes. It's a different environment, but it, I think the privilege we have is we've been here before. For me personally, I can get a lot of what I get from Twitter with a combination of Mastodon and something like TikTok because being on, you know, academic Twitter is what you get from Mastodon right now. But I'm not interacting as much with non-academics. I'm not interacting as much directly with journalists as I do. Like, I always hope that maybe like policymakers are going to see my tweets. Who knows? In terms of the push factor, some of the people who are flocking to Mastodon and other probably other parts of the Fediverse as well, but specifically Mastodon, uh, lots of academics and scientists, which I think is a 
problem. <laughs> um, because one of the things that is amazing about Twitter is what it's done for science communication. And it's not about scientists talking to each other. I wrote a piece about Mastodon for The Guardian, and I interviewed Eugene, um, you know, the, the founding developer of the platform. Uh, well, not a platform, but the, the, the thing that is called Mastodon, right? Um, and uh, what he told me is that he really wants to see Mastodon be a kind of global replacement, not just alternative, but to actually replace um, something like Twitter, um, which is different than the way that a lot of people are talking about it. And there is this kind of tension in the people who love Mastodon between should it grow or should it say kind of a small thing where we can sort of keep these uh, well-developed norms over many years, right? Um, so as someone who's kind of coming in um, to the Fediverse at this point, what's your take on that? I mean, should we want it to grow and become the, the, the only thing or the biggest thing? Um, or um, is there value to having a non-growth mindset here? I have very mixed feelings about this. Some of the discourse that I've seen on Mastodon are people who've been there for a while being quite unhappy about the influx of, <laughs> of new people. I, I have not liked that discourse very <laughs> <laughs> very much um why are they unhappy what are they saying uh i mean you know oh these people are coming in and they don't understand our norms they don't like they're mm. you know i also mm, i also saw someone use the word colonizer which was like like mm, <laughs> not a good look um mm. this is not super unusual right like i talked about you know having studied like people moving from live journal to tumblr and one of the things that happened was like Tumblr changed, like the culture changed a little bit. And also like the community of the people who moved there changed in reaction to Tumblr. One could make an argument that like, we shouldn't have any public squares, but if that's true, we lose things. Like we lose that science communication. It's just one example of the kind of thing we might lose. The thing about Mastodon is like one of the reasons it has these really strong norms that have been working really well is because it's been an incredibly homogeneous, fairly small group of people. So of course, when new types of people come in, there is conflict. So that is absolutely inevitable. And people could say they don't want that, but they also are losing something.